Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English Study Group where we study the words of the Buddha in this book series titled The Words of the Buddha, The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden. We're in volume 10 titled The Buddha's Way. Here we're exploring some various chapters from the Pali Canon and helping you to understand the words of the Buddha and what he taught is the path to enlightenment. If you're joining us for the first time, then I would like to share with you the way that we start our classes is we start with a brief meditation just to kind of prepare the mind a little bit for the class, maybe like a 10 minute meditation. Typically, people who join this program are a little bit further along in developing their practice, and maybe they've gone through the group learning program, or they're currently going through the group learning program, which is on Sunday and Wednesday. And then there's this program on Saturday, which takes the framework or the foundation that students develop in the group learning program on Sunday and Wednesday and expands upon it using exclusively the words of the Buddha in order to learn and understand this path to enlightenment. So I'd like to welcome all of you, whether you're tuning in on Facebook, YouTube, Zoom, whether you're listening to this on the replay on the podcast or wherever you might be taking in this content. Welcome to all of you guys. And I would like to invite you to join for the meditation so that you can just kind of prepare the mind for the class and then help you to retain the teachings for a longer period of time. So if you're would like to take a, a seated position or a lying or standing. These are kind of the three positions that kind of work out really well with online learning. There's also a walking position that we use when we're training together with students as well. But go ahead and take whatever position is comfortable for you. If you're seated, you probably are either on the floor in a chair. If you're on the floor, you might cross your legs lightly, put some cushions under your rear. That lessens the angle at your hips, your knees, and your ankles. And then your hands and arms, you can just rest those comfortably in your lap. The Buddha put his right hand over left with his thumbs together, and then he put that into his lap. But if that's not comfortable for you for any reason, this practice isn't about everyone doing it exactly the same. It's about finding what's comfortable for you. So you might put your palms on your thighs or your knees. If you're in a chair, you might put the arms on the armrest of a chair. Your lower body and your hands and arms should be completely relaxed during the meditation so that there's no muscles engaged whatsoever. The upper body should be erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. So you're not interested in being slouched, but you're not interested in being real rigid either. So nice and erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. Then just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. I'm gonna start with some chanting and then I'll be back with just some light guidance since people who normally join this program already have been meditating with me for a while. We just need to do a little bit of light guidance. If you'd like to join in with these chants, you're welcome to do that if you know them. And then I'll be back with some light guidance afterwards. Sawakato, 
สวัสดสังโฆสังฆนามะมิน a ปโมระสัพพะกวาโตอาราตุสัมมาสัพพุตสัพนับมรัสัพะกวาโตอาราตุสัมมาสัพพุตสัพนับมรัสัพะกวาโตอาราตุสัมมาสัพพุทธัสสะปิติปิสุเอมาเกวาอาราหังสัมมาสัมโหตุวิจจาระนังสัมโนสัคคโตโรกาวิตุอนุเตโรปุริสัดามาสติสัตตาวามานุสนังโพตุปะกวัติโอเคชีวิตบริเวณ in through the nose and out through the nose just creating a nice gradual natural breath breathing in experiencing the full breath and then wherever you get to your next exhale just exhale out through the nose experiencing the full breath Your breath isn't going to necessarily sync up with the guidance that I'm providing. This is your practice. So wherever you get to the next inhale, just breathe in gradually through the nose, experiencing the full breath, a nice natural breath. And then whenever you get to your exhale, just have a nice gradual, natural exhale. Breathing in and out. Once you've got the breath established, start fixating the mind on the breath, the sound of the breath, or the sensation of air moving in and out of the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever the mind moves off the breath, cut that off and let it go and come back to the breath. No need to observe the thought, analyze it. Try to figure out where it's coming from. No need to judge the thought or label it. Just wherever you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that off. Let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of fixating the mind on the breath. And whenever you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath. Breathing in, in, out.
to slowly make your way out of meditation. We'll just transition over to our class so that Miranda has worked out with students in Zoom to read the various chapters of volume 10 that we're studying today. Chapters 11 through 20 is what we're exploring. A student will read the chapter and then after they read a chapter, I will share any teachings on that chapter and then open up to any questions that you guys might have related to the actual chapter itself. So I'll just turn things over to all of you guys so that we can read through the various chapters I'll teach and then open up to any questions you guys might have on each individual chapter. Um, yes, uh, chapter 11, five future dangers in the way for consideration. Monks. There are these five future dangers in way of reflecting on which the diligent, de dedicated, determined monk, forest gone, ought to live just to attain the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. What five? Take the case of a monk who reflects thus. I am now young, a mere youth, black-haired and endowed with the beauty of youth, in the prime of life. But there will come a time when old age shall touch this body and when grown old and overcome by age, it is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings. It is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes upon me. Let me advance, arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease even though I am old. This is the fu first future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside diligent, dedicated, determined for the attainment of the unattained. Again, he reflects, I have health and well-being, a good digestion, which is neither too cold nor too heated, but moderate and suitable for striving. But there will come a time when sickness shall touch this body and sick and ill, it is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings. 
it is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes upon me. Let me advance, arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease even though I am sick. This is the second future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside diligent, dedicated, determined for the attainment of the unattained. Again, he reflects, food is now plentiful. There has been a good harvest and food is easy to get and is easy to keep oneself going by gathering. But there will come a time when there is famine, bad harvest and difficulty in getting food, when it will be hard to keep oneself going by a gathering. And in a time of famine, people will move to where there is plentiful food and there will dwell in living conditions that are congested and crowded. It is not easy to attend the Buddhist teachings. It is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes upon me. Let me advance, arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease even though food is not plentiful. This is the third future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside diligent, dedicated, determined for the attainment of the unattained. Again, he reflects, now men reside in friendly fellowship together, blending like milk and water without disputes, but viewing each other with eyes of affection. But there will come a time of fear, fear of robbers, and the people of the countryside will mount their vehicles and flee. Fear-stricken men will move away to where there is safety, and there one will dwell in living conditions that are congested and crowded. It is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings. It is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes upon me. Let me in advance arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease even in a time of fear. This is the fourth danger, fourth future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside diligent, dedicated, determined for the attainment of the unattained. Moreover, monks, the monk reflects thus, now the community lives in friendly fellowship together, finding comfort in one teaching, but the time will come when the community will be fractured. And when that happens, it is not easy to attend to the Buddhist teachings. It is not easy to retreat to the forest wilderness. Before that comes before that comes to me, unwished for, undesirable, disagreeable condition comes upon me. Let me in advance arouse energy for the attainment of the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. Then, when I am in that condition, I will reside at ease, even though the community is fractured. This is the fifth future danger to consider, which is enough for a monk to reside diligent, dedicated, determined for the attainment of the unattained. Monks, there are these five future dangers in the way to consider which the diligent, dedicated, determined monk, forest gone, ought to live just to attain the unattained, to master the unmastered, to realize the unrealized. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here, the Buddha is essentially giving you a heads up of these five things that will occur in the future and of course he's talking to his students at that time of things that will occur and kind of hinder or make it difficult or make it more challenging to learn the teachings he talks about old age that that's one thing that is going to cause complications in terms of learning and practicing his teachings he talks about sickness or being ill he talks about not having much food he talks about how at some point there's going to be these robbers and people in the countryside who are going to be fearful and they're going to be kind of disrupted and move about. And then he talks about the community of ordained practitioners and household practitioners that they're going to be fractured or or fall away and kind of go into these different camps and not have just one teaching during, which is what existed during his lifetime. So he's saying before any of those things occur, This is the ideal time to learn and practice the teachings during his lifetime. And then, of course, later, as these things are occurring, then it makes it more and more difficult. And he's saying, if you learn and practice, essentially getting to the goal of enlightenment, then when these things do occur, 
you will be at ease. And the reason why is because the mind will be enlightened. Once the mind's enlightened, any of these things that occur, it's not going to shake up the enlightened mind, whether it's old age, whether it's sickness, whether it's a lack of food, whether it's, you know, robbers and, you know, criminals kind of causing difficulties in the world, or whether it's the community fracturing. If the mind's already enlightened, these things aren't going to shake up an enlightened mind of an enlightened being. So he's saying these are five dangers that will occur in the future, and it's best to learn and practice applying that diligence or dedication or determination. And by understanding these things, his goal in teaching this would be to motivate and encourage kind of a rise enthusiasm amongst his students to actually learn and practice at that time rather than delay, delay, delay. Sometimes people might think like, okay, well, when I'm 50, 60, 70 years old, that's when I'll focus on getting to enlightenment. But the only challenge there is, is that the body's older, so it's getting sick. The mind is not as sharp. There's more challenges in life with the body and the mind. So essentially what he's doing is he's encouraging people to kind of seize the present moment, particularly if you're in your youth, maybe you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, there is really no bad time to start learning the teachings and start practicing them. But he's saying, you know, don't delay this. Don't be complacent. Apply diligence and dedication and determination to learning and practicing now before you encounter these difficulties. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Yes, sir. On Facebook, Amina asks, is this chapter about taking care to appreciate the current and present moment as the future is unknown? You can think of it that way. It's really focused on arising that enthusiasm and motivation to learn and practice now, right? Like a Buddha isn't going to push or force or guilt or shame or fear people into learning their teachings. But here, what he's doing is he's saying, hey, you know, essentially what he's saying is you may not see these dangers right now, but these are dangers that are going to occur in the future. And let me alert you to those dangers now. And of course, the choice of whether you learn and practice these teachings is still up to you and your decisions, and you'll experience the results of that. But as a loving and kindness and compassionate Buddha, he's alerting people to things that they might not be able to see themselves. There may be people in his community that are kind of more complacent and maybe not as dedicated and diligent in their practice. And he's arising this enthusiasm and motivation by letting them know about these future dangers that they encounter. So seizing that present moment and applying dedication and determination now will ensure that when these things do occur, because they will occur, then the mind can be at ease because it's enlightened. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Also, um, in your explanation of these teachings, you had stated that one is never too old to begin learning these teachings. Um, With regard to that, how does that apply to people who may have Alzheimer's or dementia? Can they too be introduced to the teachings? That's part of the illness that the Buddha is talking about is that's a future danger that if somebody has dementia, sure, they can be introduced to the teachings, but their ability to learn them, reflect on them, practice them, retain the understanding of those, that's where the real danger is that if one allows the mind to get to that point, then it's a real struggle to be able to really learn and make progress on the path. So what he's encouraging people to do is is learn and practice in their youth, uh, among the other things that he talked about as well. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. It appears that those are all the questions that we have on this chapter, sir. All right. So we'll go to chapter 12. Okay. Um, I believe I have... Donnie? Donnie, yes, for chapter 12. Do not decline. Continue the struggle. Two things, monks, I have realized. To never be complacent with skillful qualities and not to shrink back from the struggle. Without shrinking back, monks, I struggle on thus. Gladly would I have my skin and sinews and bones wither and my body's flesh and blood dry up, if only I may hold out until I win what may be won by human strength, by human energy, by human striving. It was by diligence that I achieved wake awakening and by diligence that I won the supreme freedom from bondage, enlightenment. And you too, monks, do not decline the contest but struggle on. 
saying to yourselves, gladly would I have my skin and sinews and bones bitter and my body's flesh and blood dry up. If only I may hold out until I win what may be won by human strength, by human energy, by human striving. And you too, monks, in no time shall win that goal for which the householders rightfully leave hold for the homeless life, even that unmatched goal of right first living, realizing it for yourselves even in this very life, and having reached it, you shall recite therein. Therefore I say unto you, monks, thus must you train yourselves. We will not decline the contest, but will struggle. All right. Thank you, Donnie. So here you can see how the chapters are connected and they're kind of one leading to the next. The one that we just read previously is essentially creating this enthusiasm and this motivation. And then here the Buddha is talking about his own experience that eliminating complacency and not shrinking back from the struggle is how he got to enlightenment. And that one should be willing to allow this body, the skin, sinews, bones, wither away and dry up if they can just win when he's talking about win or won by human strength he's talking about get to enlightenment one of the things that a buddha understands very clearly is what enlightenment feels like and what the experience of being enlightened is because a buddha they don't just snap their fingers and get to enlightenment they have to do a whole lot of work in order to get to enlightenment and then once experiencing enlightenment then that mind is so peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. They know what it felt like and what it was experienced to be angry and frustrated and irritated and feeling guilt and shame and fear and all these other discontent feelings. And now this Buddha and any enlightened being knows what it feels like to now be experiencing complete peace, calm, serenity, and contentedness with joy. And in helping others to get to enlightenment, no matter how much an enlightened being or a Buddha describes what enlightenment is, it's pretty much impossible for an unenlightened being to deeply understand what enlightenment is until they're actually experiencing it and getting to enlightenment. But still, a Buddha is going to attempt to explain it in multiple different ways at different times in order to help people to understand just how wonderful it is to be experiencing this enlightened mental state not with arrogance or ego but as a way to motivate and encourage their students so here he's explaining how you know how essentially significant it is to get to enlightenment that you know if you're willing and you can think about this is like, you know, I'd rather have my skin, sinews and bones wither away and my body's flesh dry up and the blood along with with it. As long as I can get to the point where I can at least get to enlightenment and experience what that's like, because getting to that enlightened mental state, then what the Buddha is explaining here is that the person has reached this freedom from bondage, this mind bound up with all these discontent feelings, that craving, anger, and ignorance that is causing the mind to be polluted and now experience this constant discontentedness. So it's by diligence, it's by eliminating complacency that you get to this enlightened mental state. Now, there'll be certain parts of the path that are quite enjoyable, quite fun. You know, when you come together with other community members and you get a chance to talk and spend time and you know, when you're learning certain teachings, it's like, oh, wow, this is such a wonderful teaching. There's going to be those moments where things are quite enjoyable, but there's also going to be certain struggles and certain difficulties because when you're trying to move your life practice from where it is now to this enlightened mental state, there's times where it feels like quite a struggle. And what the Buddha is saying here is, you know, don't decline from that struggle. He also says in other parts of his teachings where he says, don't shrink back from the struggle. Because if you walk away from the struggle or you run away from the struggle, then that means that there's going to be that struggle again in the future. You can't solve the struggle by running away from the struggle. So what I encourage people to do is turn around and walk towards the struggle. Because by walking towards the struggle, even though it's difficult, even though it's challenging, even though the mind wants to run away and go the opposite direction, when you turn around and you walk towards the struggle, now you can gain the wisdom that you need to overcome that struggle so that that struggle will never happen again. Whereas if you walk away or you run away from the struggle, 
you're ensuring that that's going to happen again because the whole reason why the mind is struggling in that situation is because it lacks the wisdom of how to overcome that struggle. And the only way that you're going to gain the wisdom to overcome that struggle is turn around and walk towards it. So rather than shrink back from the struggle or decline from the struggle, the Buddha is saying struggle on, you know, go forward, you know, don't walk away from this, continue to progress in your practice. And it's that diligence, that dedication, that determination that's going to allow you to move out of complacency and walk towards the struggles. And then when you're encountering those, that's where you reach out to your teacher for guidance, for help. And then as you learn the wisdom that you need to overcome that struggle, then you're ensuring that this struggle is less likely to happen in the future. Because in each individual struggle, you might not learn 100% of what you need to learn. You might only learn 20 or 40% of what you need to learn. But then it makes that struggle that much easier next time. And then next time you learn a little bit more wisdom. And then it makes it less and less significant each time you walk towards the struggle. So you're ensuring by learning and practicing, gaining that wisdom, that this struggle isn't going to be repeated. But if you run away or you walk away from the struggle, you're ensuring that it will get repeated. And that's the whole cycle of rebirth that the beings are stuck in is that as long as you're running away from the struggle and not willing to actually do the work through diligence, then you're going to stay stuck in this constant cycle of experiencing discontentedness over and over again in this life and in future lives. So walking towards the struggle is what will allow you to build the wisdom and overcome it. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear that we have any questions at this time, sir. All right. So we'll move to chapter 13. Yes, let's go to Manal to read chapter 13. Thanks, Miranda. Final knowledge is achieved by gradual training. Monks, I do not say that final knowledge, wisdom, is achieved all at once. On the contrary, final knowledge is achieved by gradual training, by gradual practice, by gradual progress. And how does there come to be a gradual training, gradual practice, gradual progress? Here, one who has confidence in a teacher visits him. When he visits him, he pays respect to him. When he pays respect to him, he gives ear. One who gives ear hears the teachings. Having heard the teachings, he memorizes them. He examines the meaning of the teachings he has memorized. When he examines their meaning, he gains a reflective understanding of those teachings. When he has gained a reflective understanding of those teachings, enthusiasm springs up in him. When enthusiasm has sprung up, he applies his will. Having applied his will, he investigates. Having investigated, he strives. Purposely striving, he realizes with the ultimate truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. All right. Thank you, Manal. This is an excellent chapter. If you've ever heard that the Buddha sat under a tree, he meditated, and he instantly got to enlightenment, this is a great chapter that you can see that that's not the truth. This is what people will often share in the oral tradition and person to person to person. It's a very big misunderstanding in the world. And this is why we see a lot of people who are doing meditation, but they're not actually studying the actual teachings to gain the wisdom and move the mind to enlightenment because a lot of people have the misunderstanding that you can just meditate your way to enlightenment, but it's not possible. And you can see it in the Buddha's words here where he says it's this gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress that leads to this final knowledge or this wisdom that then transforms the mind and moves the mind to this enlightened mental state. And he's giving guidance of how to do that and he's talking about having a teacher there's a lot of people in the world that think that they can attain enlightenment on their own without any support or any help from a teacher this is what a buddha does the last buddha that the world is currently aware of existed over 2500 years ago they can attain enlightenment a buddha is able to awake to enlightenment without the guidance of any teachers but everyone else is going to need teachers so the buddha is giving guidance here about how to gain that wisdom is by seeking out a teacher and visiting that person and then goes through a whole series of events that he's saying that this is how you essentially build up your practice your life practice and the buddha is very 
famous for doing this cause and effect and cause and effect. And okay, if this exists, then this exists. And if that exists, this exists. So he's going through one by one. You know, if you have this confidence in a teacher, you visit that person. And then when you visit them, you pay respect to them because this person is essentially teaching you without any expectations or without wanting anything from you. At least that's the kind of teacher that I would suggest that you seek out. And then by them sharing these teachings without any expectation in return, it's really wise to show respect to that teacher. So then you maintain this healthy relationship. Having respected this teacher, then you give ear, or you listen to the teachings that this teacher is sharing. Having heard the teachings, you then start memorizing them, retaining them, start to apply them in your life. He talks about examining the meaning of the teachings. He doesn't say believe the teachings, right? He never says just believe the teachings because belief isn't what's going to lead to enlightenment. You need to learn the teachings, reflect on those, independently verifying the truth for yourself, and then practice them to see the truth, that it's improving the condition of your mind. And you do that through examining the meaning of the teachings that you've memorized, not actually believing them. Or here, he also goes on and he talks about gaining this reflective understanding of those teachings. That's what I talk about learning, reflecting, right? Starting to independently verifying the teachings. And then you might observe that this enthusiasm springs up when you start realizing like, oh, wow, this is such an amazing teaching from the Buddha. Like it really is going to be very impactful for my life. You start getting this joy or this enthusiasm that springs up in the mind. And then you start applying your will to actually start applying these teachings in daily life and applying your intention behind it and investigating the teachings more deeply. And then you strive, you really apply effort and energy towards bringing these teachings into your life and then seeing them improve the condition of the mind. And then all of this is culminating into helping you to realize the ultimate truth that these teachings are indeed the truth. And then you can see that with your own eyes seeing the penetrating wisdom of these teachings because you see the discontentedness in your mind gradually diminish. When things used to once arise anger in the mind and then you get to the point where that anger no longer exists and it's gradually diminished, you can see the truth for yourself that it's these teachings that have done that. But it's gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. So sometimes the mind wants what it wants, right? That's what the unenlightened mind does. It has this craving, desire, attachment. It wants the objects of its affection. So oftentimes when you hear about this enlightened mental state that's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy that's permanent, a unenlightened mind can start craving that and wanting it right now in the next month or the next six months. But as you understand, the Buddha took six years total to get to enlightenment. So it's going to take you some time to get to enlightenment. So if you understand that and you just gradually work towards the goal rather than craving it or trying to be perfect today, you can't be perfect today because there's certain pollutions in the mind that are inhibiting you from doing that. But that doesn't mean you become complacent, but it also, you shouldn't crave and desire and yearn for enlightenment either. You've got to practice that middle way where the mind has this objective or this goal or this interest to progress towards enlightenment and realizing that that happens gradually. You can be easy with yourself so that when you're learning something like right speech and you slip up and you're not practicing right speech, then you can just aim to do better and you can work towards improving to do better, realizing that it's a gradual training, gradual practice and gradual progress. Even the Buddha himself had to go through that gradual practice. And that's where the dedication and diligence comes in that he was talking about earlier. That if you have that dedication and diligence, then you'll be willing to gradually train, gradually practice, and you'll experience this gradual progress. It's not a a sudden event. So here he says, monks, I do not say that final knowledge is attained or achieved all at once, right? Even though other people say that about the Buddha, he never said that. This tree that people associate with his enlightenment, he basically gave that as a place where people can consider and go visit, kind of consider where he attained enlightenment. But in reality, he attained it over this six-year period of time. So this is where the misunderstanding comes in. He sat under this tree 
after he attained enlightenment, he sits under this tree for about seven weeks contemplating whether or not he should share his teachings with the world or not because what he had to share was so different than what other people were doing. During his lifetime, people were causing harm to the body. They were starving the body. They were hanging upside down from trees. They were taking metal implements and piercing the skin, causing this physical pain to the body, thinking that that's how you train the mind to get to enlightenment. But he discovered that's not the truth. So his teachings were so different because it was all based on this wisdom in this middle way that he didn't think people were going to be interested in learning. And it would be too much of a challenge to actually share them with people and help people to actually learn them. So he sat under this tree and contemplated for seven weeks of whether or not he should actually share his teachings. And ultimately, we know what happened is he did share his teachings, but it wasn't that he sat under this tree and instantly got to enlightenment. And you can see that in his own words. So what questions do you guys have on this chapter? Yes, sir. On Facebook, Amina asks, can you further explain the phrase applies his will with an example? Yes. So you might think of apply his will as uh, right effort, which you know is right effort, Amina. So that uh, rather than being complacent and indifferent and not really applying any effort, that you apply your will or you apply your effort to bring these teachings into your practice because it's going to take effort. You can't just, you know, trip and kind of fall into enlightenment. It's going to be through conscious decisions and applying effort towards developing your practice. So you can think of it as having this energy or this effort or this will towards working to learn these teachings and bring them into your practice. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Also, you've explained that um, craving a lot of progress, immediate progress is on one side and then complacency is on the other of this middle path of how to practice. But because of the universal truth of impermanence, does that middle way of practice tend to be different person by person and even for the same person, might it be different at different times of their life, sir? Yeah, your practice is gonna go through these periods where maybe for three months or six months, however long, you might be reading these books a lot. You might be attending classes pretty regularly. You might be really getting into your meditation practice. You might even be getting personal guidance from your teacher. And then after you kind of go over that period of time, four months, six months, however long, then you might kind of step away for a little bit and kind of put into practice the things that you learned during that period. You're still not being complacent because you're putting into practice what it is that you learn. When you are in that period where maybe you're not coming to class, maybe you're not reading as much, maybe you're not getting involved with your teacher as much, but you're still meditating, you're still observing the condition of the mind, eliminating unwholesome qualities, arising wholesome qualities, you're still working on right speech, you're trying to digest these teachings and put them into practice. And you might do that for several months and then you come back and you start learning in classes again, you start reading books, you start getting into your meditation practice more deeply, you start spending more time interacting with your teacher. And you might go through these periods like that where you're getting involved in the classes and so forth, and then you go away for a while. And oftentimes what I hear from students is they feel like when they go away, they feel like they're complacent because they're not reading the books, they're not coming to classes as much. And I help them and I let them see that your practice is more than learning in terms of reading books. Sometimes when people start out for the first six months or the first year, they're doing a lot of the reading, they're doing a lot of the classes. And then when they slowly stop doing that, uh, in order to go off and start practicing the teachings a bit, they feel like they're being complacent because they're not comfortable with this impermanence that they're no longer reading as much, they're no longer coming to class as much. So what complacency is, is where you just are lackluster, you're indifferent, you're not doing anything to apply effort and energy towards bringing these teachings into your life. So reading and coming to classes, spending time with your teacher, that's one way to build up your learning. But then once you do the learning and you go off and you start practicing the teachings, there you're not necessarily complacent just because you're meditating, you're working on right speech, you're working on your relationships, you're doing these kind of things that's still not complacency. In that situation, what complacency would be is if a thought of 
something unwholesome comes into the mind and you tolerate it and you allow it to reside in the mind. So maybe you think about something hateful or vindictive or resentful and you just allow that to permeate in the mind and you don't do anything about it. That would be complacency. Whereas if you've been away from learning for a while, you haven't gone to classes, you haven't been reading books as much, but that thought of hatred or resentfulness or jealousy arises in the mind and you take action to cut that off and let it go, eliminate it from the mind, that's not complacency. You're taking action. The, the real project is to work on the condition of the mind. And you're going to go through these periods of reading, coming to classes, spending time with your teacher, maybe going away, implementing that stuff, and then coming back, reading, going to classes, spending time with your teacher, and you'll go through these periods. But throughout that entire time frame, you should be observant of the mind or practicing mindfulness or awareness of mind so that where you see unwholesome qualities, you're working to eliminate those. And then where you see wholesome qualities, you're working to cultivate those and bring those into the mind. And that is how you understand that your practice is impermanent, that you're going to go through these periods of time like that. And that's completely normal. That's what you have to do. You're not going to be able to have your nose in a book for the next 20 years and just solely be focused on reading. You need to allow your practice to shift and change like this. And that's where you'll be able to take the intellectual learning move it into reflection and move it into practice. And then after you do that for a while, then come back to the intellectual learning, reflecting and then practicing. And this is how you gradually awaken the mind to enlightenment. Thank you, sir. Uh, it appears those are all the questions we have at this time. All right, so we'll move to the next chapter, chapter 14. To select the place to live. Here, monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket. While he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness does not become established. His unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated. His undestroyed taints do not come to destruction. He does not attain the unattained supreme security from bondage, enlightenment, and also the necessities to sustain life that should be obtained by one gone forth. Robes, alms food, resting place, and medical care are hard to come by. That monk should depart from that jungle thicket that very night or that very day. He should not continue living there. Here, monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket. While he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness does not become established. His unconcentrated mind does not become concentrated. His undestroyed taints do not come to destruction. He does not attain the unattained supreme security from bondage. Yet the necessities to sustain life that should be obtained by one gone forth, robes, alms food, resting place, and medical care, are easy to come by. The monk should consider thus, however, I did not go forth from the home life into homelessness for the sake of robes, alms food, resting place, and med medicinal care. Having reflected thus, that monk should depart from that jungle thicket, he should not continue living there. Here, monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket. While he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness becomes established. His unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated. His undestroyed taints come to destruction. He attains the unattained supreme security from bondage. Yet, the necessity to sustain life that should be obtained by one gone forth, robes, alms food, resting place, and medical care, are hard to come by. The monk should consider thus. However, I did not go forth from the home life into homelessness for the sake of robes, alms food, resting place, and medicinal care. Having reflected thus, that monk should continue living in that jungle thicket, he should not depart. Here, monks, a monk lives in some jungle thicket. While he is living there, his unestablished mindfulness becomes established. His unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated. His undestroyed taints come to destruction. He attains the unattained supreme security from bondage, enlightenment, and also the necessities to sustain life that should be obtained by one gone forth. Robes, alms food, resting place, and medical care are easy to come by. That monk should continue living in that jungle thicket as long as life lasts. He should not depart. In the case of selecting a certain village, town, city, country, person, similar discourses were spoken. All right, thank you, Miranda. 
So here, even though the Buddha is giving guidance to ordained practitioners, you can actually use this in your life as well. He's giving four scenarios of things that will happen in terms of selecting a place to live and providing you guidance of what's important to be thinking about. And there's essentially two things that he's talking about. One is the development of your mind and moving to enlightenment. And then he talks about obtaining things that are the necessities to live life. And what you see is that he's prioritizing the development of the mind. So if you're living in an environment where you're not able to develop your mind very well, and it's very challenging for you to obtain the necessities to live life, the Buddha says you should leave this place at once, essentially. You shouldn't stay there and continue to live there, leave that very night or leave that very day. That's the first part that he talks about because you're not developing your mind and it's very difficult for you to sustain your life with the basic necessities. So leave that place almost immediately is what he's saying. Then the second scenario is, okay, you're not able to develop your mind, but the necessities to live life are easily accessible. And he's saying, okay, you shouldn't continue to live there either because you're not really accomplishing the true goals, which is to develop your mind. So he's saying you should leave that place. Then he says, okay, if you're living in a place where you're developing your mind and you're progressing on this path to enlightenment, but it's a bit challenging in order to acquire the necessities of life, he's saying, okay, you can live in this place because you're essentially accomplishing the goal, which is to develop your mind. But then the ideal environment would be a place where you're developing your mind, progressing on this path to enlightenment, and it's easy for you to obtain the necessities of life. And this is a way that you can look at your choices to live as well. That if you're in an environment where you're finding it difficult to work on the condition of the mind and or obtain the necessities of life, the Buddha is saying, leave this place. But where you're observing that you can actually develop your mind, but maybe the necessities are a little bit more challenging to acquire, then, hey, at least you're developing your mind and that's the real goal. But if you can find a place where you can develop your mind and acquire the necessities of life, he's saying, live in this place as long as life lasts. You should not depart. And that here he's talking about a jungle thicket because oftentimes the ordained practitioners would live in the forest. But this also applies to a certain village, a certain town or city, a country and so forth. So you can apply this to the places that you might choose to live, kind of look around you and see how are you doing in terms of developing your mind in this path to enlightenment, in terms of being able to acquire the necessities that you need to live life? What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear there are any questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll go to chapter 15. Yes, let's go to Donnie to read chapter 15. With the elimination of excitement comes the complete destruction of discontentedness. Puna, there are forms recognizable by the eyes that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing to think. If a monk does not seek excitement in them, does not welcome them, and does not remain holding to them, excitement is eliminated in him. If the elimination of the excitement, Puna, that is the elimination of discontentedness, I say, there are Puna, sounds recognizable by the ear, odors recognizable by the nose, flavors recognizable by the tongue, physical objects recognized by the body, mental objects recognized by the mind. They are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tempting. If a monk does not seek excitement in them, does not welcome them, and does not remain holding to them, excitement is eliminated in him. With the elimination of excitement, Buddha, there is the elimination of discontentedness, I say. All right. Thank you, Dani. Here, this is going back to the book previous to this, Volume 9, where we studied the six sense bases. And it's essentially talking about these conditioned pleasant feelings, that if we allow the mind to have this condition based on longing and yearning and craving and desiring through these sense bases of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the bodily contact in the mind, as long as we allow the mind to take this excitement and this agreeable, pleasing, centrally enticing and tempting things that you're experiencing through the sense bases, as long as you're allowing the mind to do that, 
yeah, you're going to experience those temporary pleasant feelings of excitement or thrill, euphoria, but you're setting yourself up to fail because those conditions are impermanent. It's only a matter of time before the mind now experiences this change or this impermanence, and now it's going to experience painful feelings. So by training the mind to eliminate its longing and yearning through the sense bases and wanting these pleasant feelings through the sense bases, now you can eliminate all discontentedness. We don't realize in the unenlightened state and when we have lack of wisdom that our chasing after the objects of our affection for pleasant feelings through the sense bases is what's leading to the painful feelings. So when we get that new job, we are so excited, so happy, so much pleasure coming into the mind, and we really enjoy this for three months or six months or a year, what have you. And when we then maybe lose that job and we experience this anger or sadness or frustration, Those things are so far apart from each other that we don't associate those painful feelings of the anger and frustration in others to the fact that we allow the mind to become excited to begin with. So that's why the Buddha taught this middle way. So when you're experiencing certain things in life, you can enjoy certain things in life, but when you allow the mind to cling to it and arise those conditioned pleasant feelings, that's when you're setting yourself up for painful feelings as well. So by understanding this wisdom, now whenever you are experiencing certain things in life, just train the mind to not crave and yearn through these sense spaces so that as things are happening, you don't let the mind cling and arise these conditioned pleasant feelings. Because if you allow the mind to arise these conditioned pleasant feelings, it's only a matter of time before these painful feelings come in and invade the mind. So it's training to do things very differently than we've been taught throughout our life is that we're kind of taught to get excited and show our excitement and be thrilled and euphoric when maybe a friend comes over to visit us or our child brings home a good report card or an artwork that they worked on and to just be so thrilled and oh my goodness this is so amazing this is so great but you can actually show positive encouragement to your child without having this off the wall excitement. You can show your friends and your family that you appreciate them coming to visit you or bringing you a gift or inviting you out to dinner or things like this. You can show your appreciation and gratitude without this over the top excitement. And that's gonna take some training of the mind because you're so used to doing it this other way that we've been doing throughout our life. So when you gradually train the mind to not allow it to get in this excited state where the mind is uncalm, you can now maintain this calmness, this composure, this evenness of temper. And now you can have this mindfulness or awareness of mind, this concentration or clarity of mind, and you can have access to wisdom making wiser decisions in your life. Whereas if we allow this excitement and these conditioned pleasant feelings to invade the mind, not only are you welcoming in the painful feelings, but you're also allowing the mind to be shaken up and uncalm. So now you don't have awareness of mind or mindfulness. You don't have concentration and you're not able to access wisdom because the mind is shaken up in this situation. So by training the mind to not do this, now the Buddha is saying, okay, you can eliminate discontentedness when you eliminate the chasing of pleasant feelings. That's what he's talking about here with the elimination of excitement because the excitement is only going to exist in the mind if there's craving, desire, attachment, if there's longing and yearning for these pleasant feelings, if that's allowed to persist, then it's only a matter of time before the painful feelings come into the mind. So if you eliminate the mind longing, yearning, and chasing these conditioned pleasant feelings, then you can eliminate all discontentedness, is what the Buddha is actually saying here. So if you're willing to let go of these temporary conditioned pleasant feelings, then you can get to this permanent joy where the Buddha talks about enlightenment is beyond pleasure and pain. Because in the unenlightened state, we think that that's what life's all about, is chasing after these happy moments, these exciting moments, and we kind of live for those moments. But they're just temporary. That's why they're so unsatisfactory, and they're displeasing, because they only last for a temporary period of time, and then your mind's right back into the painful feelings or some other feeling. So by cutting that off and letting that go, practicing the middle way, letting go of these temporary pleasant feelings, now you can experience that permanent joy 
of the enlightened mental state. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Manal has her hand raised, sir, so let's go to her. Thanks, Miranda. So, Teacher David, I've been reflecting on um, the uh, arising of excitement. And, um, and in different instances, this has uh, risen and uh, recognized that uh, I've got to come back to the middle and um, you know, continue practicing and being observant of what arises in the future. Um, the only thing is that it seems that the excitement still arises. However, it drops very quickly. But that excite. Uh, my question is probably: Is it? Is it an? Uh, um, should a practitioner basically refrain from having excitement if it is understood that it is arising at that moment? Or should that sort of unfold and manifest and then you come back to the middle? Because I'm at the point where uh, I've recognized, I can recognize at times that this is this is what's about to be arisen um, and it's still comfortable, it's not uncomfortable. So I'm not sure how to sort of delegate those moments, if you can assist. Sure. So when we talk about right mindfulness and the four foundations of mindfulness, we talk about those bodily sensations associated with things like anger and sadness, frustration. You feel certain bodily sensations and you cut it off and let it go there so that it doesn't become feelings in the mind. It doesn't affect the condition of the mind. It doesn't feed these mental objects. Well, the pleasant feelings has the same exact sequence that as the Buddha describes the four foundations of mindfulness and what the body and the mind is going to experience is the same thing with the conditioned pleasant feelings. So you'll observe these bodily sensations starting to arise as there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind and there's these pleasant feelings arising. You should cut that off and let that go because if you allow that to then become feelings in the mind, then it's only a matter of time that this same exact craving that led to the arising of conditioned pleasant feelings is going to result in painful feelings because that condition that is occurring that is arising the pleasant feelings it's not permanent so when that changes then the mind's going to experience these painful feelings so by cutting that off as a bodily sensation slowly but surely the craving desire attachments are eliminated from the mind and you won't even experience the arising of bodily sensations anymore because the mind is just permanently peaceful calm serene and content with joy if it's raining outside it's peaceful calm serene and content with joy if it's sunny outside it's peaceful calm serene and content with joy but if you look outside and it's sunny and you get all excited You've got to observe those bodily sensations and cut it off there so you don't allow the mind to base its inner feelings on the sun's out. Because if you do, then when it's raining out, now the mind's going to be angry or frustrated or annoyed or irritated because that condition of sunshine isn't permanent. So in the situation that you're describing, you still need to cut that off and let it go because it's going to ultimately lead to the painful feelings so even the conditioned pleasant feelings that's still discontentedness and it's going to lead to continued problems if you allow the mind to do that okay I, also the uh, follow-up question i believe uh, this is this is what has been observed is that the difference between joy and uh, excitement, uh, there is still um, a, a, a deeper understanding that needs to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, how it is exhibited and how um, it is experienced. So perhaps that's um, where I'm leaning into is that it's, um, I wouldn't associate it with excitement. It is joy, but it is joy that is sort of personified and sort of um, exuberant in nature. And then I will reel it back into understanding that coming back to the middle is what is important at that moment after that. So perhaps um, there is still a little bit of understanding that needs to happen with the mind and the difference between joy and excitement. Sure. So excitement is this conditioned pleasant feeling. You're going to feel it arise. It's going to change and then it's going to fade away. 
and it's going to be based on some condition. That's why it's arising, changing, and fading away. The joy of the enlightened mind is just always there. It's just going to persist. There's no reason why the mind is joyful. It's just joyful. You might easily be able to smile. You might easily be able to just sit around and enjoy whatever is happening. And if somebody asks you, like, you have such a big smile on your face, why? Just because, you know, there's no reason why that the enlightened mind, this joy that I talk about, it's just always joyful. Where the excitement is going to be based on some condition, you're going to feel it arise, change, and fade away. But the joy, it doesn't arise, it doesn't change, and it doesn't fade away. As you're getting glimpses of enlightenment and the mind is not yet enlightened, you will feel the joy kind of come into the mind and then it'll be gone. So you'll get these glimpses of what enlightenment is like and you'll experience these glimpses of this unconditioned joy. Or if we would like to even call it unconditioned happiness, we can call it that. But this excitement or this happiness, these conditioned pleasant feelings, you will have something happen or you'll get news of something or something will come into your sense bases and you will feel this arising and then there'll be this changing and then there'll be this fading away. But this unconditioned joy or this joy or this unconditioned happiness, it doesn't happen that way. You'll just wake up or during your day, the mind will just be joyful for no reason whatsoever. That's the difference between them. This was very helpful because I can see see a little bit better that there was excitement when excitement occurred because I could I could sense the fall. I can I can sense that it, it was fizzling away. So I could distinguish better than then that was excitement or as joy, as you described it, is ever present. Yes, exactly. And sometimes as the mind's getting more and more enlightened and you're experiencing this peaceful, calm, serene and content mind with joy, you can get excited about that. Right? And that's like a condition that, oh, look at the mind. It's so peaceful. It's so calm. It's so serene. It's so joyful. Oh, wow. I'm so excited about that. The Buddha was actually true. You know, like I'm getting to enlightenment. Wow. But then when that peacefulness fades, now the excitement's gone. So the mind kind of like plays this little trick on you. So you have to be observant of that and don't allow any conditioned feelings to arise for any reason whatsoever. And that's a practice. You know, the, you are going to have conditioned pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant for quite a while until you kind of rein this in and you get this restraint of the mind and you can start honing in on these different cravings that are causing it. And then once you hone in on that and you can cut this off easier and easier, then the mind can come into this unconditioned joy more readily and it'll persist for longer periods of time. But where you see that in the mind, you're not interested in getting excited about it. If you see that peaceful, calm, serene and content mind with joy during meditation or during your daily life, just take note of it and be like, hmm, that's interesting. Wow, that's quite amazing. But don't allow the mind to get so excited about that because that's still a condition feeling and then it's going to fade away. So that's where I talk about enlightenment is this light that's flickering, that you'll get these glimpses of what enlightenment is like, and it'll stay on for longer and longer periods of time, even sometimes three months, six months, and then it'll kind of go away for a few minutes or a few hours, and then it'll come back on. So in order to allow the mind to fully come into enlightenment, You've just got to be observant of the mind and know that it's there when you're experiencing that peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. But don't allow the mind to get excited about it because it's going to be gone if you do. So it takes time to experience this and hone in on it more and more and more. Thank you. You're welcome. It does not appear there are any more questions about this chapter at this time, sir. All right. So now we go to chapter 16. Yes, let's go to Manal to read chapter 16. Ms. Miranda, the cause of discontentedness. There are, Mingajala, forms recognizable by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tempting. If a monk seeks excitement, pleasant feelings in them, welcomes them and remains holding to them, excitement arises. When there is excitement, there is craving and desire. When there is craving and desire, there is bondage. 
found by the fetter of sensual desire, Michela, a monk, is called one dwelling with a partner. In the case of sounds recognizable by the ear, odors recognizable by the nose, flavors recognizable by the tongue, physical objects recognizable by the body, mental objects recognizable by the mind, the discourse the discourses are similar to that of forms recognizable by the eye. Okay, this is the same thing that we were just talking about, but here the Buddha is honing in on craving, desire, attachment, and helping you to see that even those conditioned pleasant feelings are being caused by this craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness, and that the mind is still in bondage there. It's still fettered. It's still unenlightened when this is being experienced. And he's talking about this fetter of central desire, which ultimately gets eliminated when the mind moves into the third stage of enlightenment. Those 10 fetters, as you've seen me teach on the four stages of enlightenment, you eliminate those as you're developing your practice. And the Buddha calls this one dwelling with a partner. The partner is the craving desire attachment. Even if you're alone, he says you're with a partner because you've got this craving desire attachment that's essentially burdening the mind. And when you let go of this, then he says, okay, now you're dwelling as a lone dweller. You're no longer with this partner of craving desire attachment weighing you down on your shoulders. So this is along the same lines of what we were talking about in the last book of volume nine in the last chapter as well. Do you guys have any questions on this chapter? It does not appear there are any questions on this chapter, sir. All right, chapter 17. With the elimination of excitement, there is the elimination of discontentedness. Puna, there are forms recognizable by the eye, sounds recognizable by the ear, odors recognizable by the nose, flavors recognizable by the tongue, physical objects recognizable by the body, mental objects recognizable by the mind that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and capable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of craving. If a monk does not experience excitement, pleasant feelings in them, welcome them and remain holding to them, excitement is eliminated in him. With the elimination of excitement, Guna, there is the elimination of discontentedness, I say. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So this is, again, very similar to the ones that we were just talking about. But I would like to just hone in on some of the language that the Buddha is using here in these chapters, where he says that, you know, we experience this contact through the six sense bases, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, bodily contact, and the mind. And you can observe this, that whenever the mind is discontent, whether it's pleasant feelings, painful feelings, or neither painful nor pleasant, the mind is experiencing some contact through these six sense bases that is either likable and agreeable, or it's disagreeable and unlikable, something that the mind doesn't like. So what you're ultimately trying to get to is that you understand all these things that you're experiencing through the sense bases, they're all impermanent. And rather than having these agreeable things and these disagreeable things is essentially blur that where you hear a sound and it's just a sound it's not neither agreeable nor disagreeable it's not likable nor unlikable it's just a sound and it's impermanent and it doesn't mean that the mind has to be shaken up it doesn't have to take these you know excited pleasant feelings because it's something that you like and it's agreeable therefore you won't experience these painful feelings because it's disagreeable so if you get away from the agreeable and disagreeable or the likable and the unlikable then this helps you to eliminate any craving desire attachment that's in the mind because you just see it as sound or you just see it as a as an odor or you just see it as a certain flavor so when you're eating food, it's like, oh, this chocolate cake is really quite delicious. They, they did a good job with this cake. But it's not, oh, my goodness, this is just the best chocolate cake. I can't believe that I got this chocolate cake. It's so amazing. Oh, my goodness, I could eat this all day long, right? That's that craving, desire, attachment, those conditioned, pleasant feelings that now you come back next time and it's like, Oh, you don't have chocolate cake. Oh, man, I wish I had that chocolate cake. This is where the complaining, the painful feelings come in because there's this agreeable contact and this disagreeable contact. So you would like to get to the point where you can practice this middle way where you're enjoying the chocolate cake and you know it's good chocolate cake, but you don't allow the mind to, to 
hold on to it and to cling to it, right? Or if you hear a certain sound, a certain music, it's like, oh, wow, that's really good music. But it's not agreeable versus disagreeable because then when you hear a sound that is not so nice, it's just like, oh, wow, that's an interesting sound. <laughs> but you know it's impermanent, so you don't allow the mind to get shaken up by it. And this is how you can get to the point where you just recognize that all this contact coming through the six sense bases is all impermanent. And it's only a matter of time before these things leave. So it doesn't make sense to cling to it and hold on to it for these pleasant feelings because when it's gone, you're just going to experience painful feelings. Or if you have this agreeable contact, you're going to get pleasant feelings. And then when you have this disagreeable contact, you're going to get these painful feelings. So to get away from the painful feelings, you have to be willing to let go of clinging and holding on to this agreeable contact where the pleasant feelings are arising. Just maintain that middle way where the mind can be stable and steady. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear that we have any questions on this chapter, sir. All right. And here's another one around this same topic. Yes, let's go to the destruction. The destruction of excitement. Monks, attend carefully to forms. Recognize the impermanent of forms as it really is. When a monk, attending carefully to forms, recognizes the impermanence of forms as it really is, he feels indifferent towards forms. With the destruction of excitement, of pleasant feelings, comes destruction of craving and desire. With the destruction of craving and desire, comes destruction of excitement. With the destruction of excitement, craving and desire, the mind is said to be well liberated. In the case of sounds, odor, flavors, physical objects, and mental objects, the discourses are similar to that of forms. All right. Thank you, Donnie. So this is what I was just actually mentioning, that when you're having certain contact through the sense bases and you realize like, wow, this is quite nice, recognize the impermanence of it right from the beginning. Because what the unenlightened, untrained mind likes to tend to do is as soon as you start experiencing this contact, and it's agreeable. It's like, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. It just wants to get mired into this agreeable contact and experience these pleasant feelings. It's almost like a pig slopping around in mud. It just wants to slop around in that mud all day long and it doesn't want to do anything else. That's the mind clinging and holding on to this agreeable contact. But when you're experiencing something right away, you should see the danger in this, in this gratification, allowing the mind to take this gratification. That's going to be a real danger because you're going to arise these pleasant feelings and it's only a matter of time before the painful feelings come in. So right from the beginning, if you recognize the impermanent nature of this thing, of whatever is occurring, then you can kind of get ahead of the curve and not allow the mind to hold on to it to begin with. So using the example of the chocolate cake, you look at the chocolate cake, oh wow, that's a beautiful chocolate cake. But right away, you should be telling yourself, this is impermanent, it's not gonna last forever. And then you take your first bite of it, hmm, that's some quite good chocolate cake, right? And you're kind of already starting to practice in your mind, this is impermanent. Don't allow the mind to cling to it. Let me give another example. If you are having children around you and maybe you're sharing the children with your ex-spouse or something like that, there's joint custody. Once your children come back to spend time with you, if you revel in this and you allow the mind to get all these pleasant feelings, you know that that time is impermanent with your children. They're gonna eventually go back to the other spouse's house or one day they're going to get married and move away or just move away on their own and be single or what have you. So when you spend time with people, and it's enjoyable to spend time with people. You need to always recognize that this is impermanent, not allowing the mind to cling and hold on to it. Because if you do, when these children or these partners or your family members or what have you need to leave and move on, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be sorrowful. You're going to be discontent with painful feelings. So not allowing the mind to have those 
conditioned pleasant feelings will protect the mind from not having these painful feelings. And the way that you do that is by recognizing the impermanent nature of this situation. So when people are coming into your life, just know right away that they're impermanent. So like when a new student comes to learn with me, I don't get all excited because I know that this student is impermanent and they're going to come in and out and they're not going to be with me permanently. So when a new student comes in and starts to learn, okay, I'll teach them, I'll share with them. When they're asking questions, I will help them. But then when they are gone and they're no longer around, okay, that's fine too. Whereas if when a new student came to learn with me, if I was like so excited that this new student came, then when they're gone, the mind's going to be experiencing these painful feelings. So you recognize the impermanent nature of all these things right from the very beginning. And that's how you can protect the mind. And then it's less likely to have craving or clinging or wanting to hold on to this. As you get more trained and you do that, what I just described, recognizing the impermanence, as you get more trained, the mind will just do this naturally all the time. It'll never cling to anything. But in the meantime, you've got to kind of get ahead of the curve. And right away, when you start noticing something enjoyable happening, just realize that it's impermanent and don't allow the mind to cling and hold on to it. What questions do you guys have on this? Yes, sir. Um, it is understood that it's the probably the best practice to do this moment by moment as things are occurring. Is it also helpful for a practitioner to observe these situations later on to reflect on them um, and then observe how they were impermanent? Yes, that's helpful too to soak the impermanence into your mind. Since, Miranda, you posting about your car on Facebook, we can maybe use your tires as an example, right? Like, you got those brand new tires. If you allow the mind to be like, oh, yeah, I got these brand new tires. Yay, I'm on the road again. Let me just drive with these tires. Yay, I got them fixed. And then, boom, a couple of days later, you got a screwdriver into your tires. It's like, oh, man, right? So right away, when you're getting those brand new tires, while you're even watching the mechanic put them on your car, it's almost like these are impermanent. They're not going to stay brand new tires permanently. I need to realize these tires are going to go flat at some point too. They're going to get old as well. Kind of really soaking that into the mind. But if you don't do that, then you know later on, yeah, you can start soaking that into the mind more and more and just realizing that all these things are impermanent. And then what you would like to do is more and more get ahead of the curve where you're not allowing the mind to cling or, or hold on to any of this stuff because all these things are impermanent around you. And as, as soon as you allow the mind to cling to it, you're setting yourself up to fail at that point. And what you need to do is kind of experience enough of these that the mind deeply soaks the universal truth of impermanence into it. So that's why even when you're learning this path and you understand this path, you start putting together a lot of these teachings, even a year or two into this, your mind's still going to be experiencing discontentedness because you just haven't had enough experiences yet to get the mind to the point where it deeply understands impermanence and it's been deeply trained to not cling to any of these things. So Miranda, you were talking before class about how, you know, okay, all through this whole situation, your mind was pretty content and pretty peaceful. But then when you got to the jack and you realized the jack wasn't able to get your car up to where it needed to, that's where a little bit of annoyance set in. And that's where just being on, you know, protecting the mind with mindfulness and guarding those doorways where you just know that even jacking up the car, you know, it's not going to just necessarily work right from the beginning and realize like, okay, I've got this impermanent situation. The jack is not getting the, the car up to where it needs to be that last little bit. All right, well, what can I apply? What decision making, what wisdom can I apply here that gets this car up to where it needs to be? And then that allows us to not get annoyed or irritated or frustrated or angry because those discontent feelings aren't helping us to apply wisdom to the situation. It's actually making the situation worse. So when we realize that all these things are impermanent and all we're doing is just making decision after decision after decision, and by maintaining our calmness of mind, we have that mindfulness, we have that concentration, and now we can use wisdom to make wiser decisions to move through the task that we're needing to 
to complete in order to get any one particular thing accomplished. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, it does not appear there are any more questions at this time, sir. All right. So we've got chapter 19 here. Yes, let's go to Manal to read chapter 19. Sure, thank you. The suitable way for attaining Nirvana, enlightenment, first discourse. Monks, I will teach you the way that is suitable for attaining, attaining Nibbana, enlightenment. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. And what, monks, is the way that is suitable for attaining Nibbana, enlightenment? Here a monk sees the eye as impermanent. He sees forms as impermanent. He sees eye consciousness as impermanent. He sees eye contact as impermanent. He sees as impermanent whatever feeling arises with eye contact as condition whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the ear as impermanent. He sees sounds as impermanent. He sees ear consciousness as impermanent. He sees ear contact as impermanent. He sees as impermanent whatever feeling arises with ear contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the nose as impermanent. He sees odors as impermanent. He sees nose consciousness as impermanent. He sees nose contact as impermanent. He sees as impermanent whatever feeling arises with nose contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the tongue as impermanent. He sees flavors as impermanent. He sees tongue consciousness as impermanent. He sees tongue contact as impermanent. He sees as impermanent whatever feeling arises with tongue contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the body as impermanent. He sees physical objects as impermanent. He sees body consciousness as impermanent. He sees body contact as impermanent. He sees as impermanent whatever feeling arises with body contact as condition, whether ple pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the mind as impermanent. He sees mental objects as impermanent. He sees mind consciousness as impermanent. He sees mid mind contact as impermanent. He sees as impermanent whatever feeling arises with mind contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. This monks is the way that is suitable for attaining Nibbana, enlightenment. All right. Thank you, Manol. So here we're going to go through a series of three chapters where the Buddha is talking about the three universal truths and relating it to the six sense bases. So let me just give you guys a refresher. And for some of you guys that maybe weren't here, as we studied some of these chapters in the past, is there's these six internal sense bases, which are the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. These are internal sense bases, or you can think of them as organs, right? And then there's these external sense bases. So the eyes see certain forms. The form is the external sense base. For the ear, Sound is the external sense base. For the nose, the odors are the external sense base. For the tongue, the flavors are the external sense bases. For the body, physical objects are the external sense base. And for the mind, mental objects are the external sense base. So there's these internal six sense bases, and there's these external sense bases. The eyes see certain physical forms. The ear hear certain sounds the nose smell certain odors the tongue tastes certain flavors the body comes in contact with certain physical objects and the mind is aware or recognizing certain mental objects then there's this certain consciousness or what the buddha calls i consciousness so the way that this works and you can independently verify all this stuff remember because you're not wanting to believe any of this is the eye, the internal sense base, sees a certain form. And when it sees that certain form, then there's awareness of that form. The Buddha calls that eye consciousness. So the mind becomes aware of the form that the eye is seeing. So the eye, with seeing physical forms, it has this eye consciousness or awareness of the physical form. And then that's called eye contact, where now through contact of the eye, you see certain forms, the mind's aware of it, and now we have certain contact. Once there's contact, now if there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind, 
because of eye contact as condition, there's going to then be this arising of pleasant feelings, the arising of painful feelings, and the arising of neither painful nor pleasant feelings. This is how central desire arises these feelings that you have a certain thing in the eye, you see a certain form, the mind becomes aware of it, that's contact. And now because of that, there's a rising of these feelings because of this craving desire attachment, this mental longing and strong eagerness in the mind, there's these conditioned pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. And this is happening with all of the six sense bases. So if you hear something agreeable, if you hear agreeable sounds and the mind becomes aware of it or ear consciousness, that's because of the contact or the ear contact. And now there's these pleasant feelings because it's agreeable. There's these painful feelings if it's disagreeable. And then there's these neither painful nor pleasant feelings. So what the Buddha is saying here is that a person to get to enlightenment, you need to see all these things as impermanent. That's how you get to enlightenment. He's saying the way that's suitable for attaining in Nibbana or enlightenment. You have to be able to see that all these things are impermanent because the more that you understand that these things are impermanent, then the mind is going to be less likely to cling to them and hold on to them. There's still training that you need to do, but by recognizing the impermanent nature of all this forms, sounds, odors, flavors, physical objects, and mental objects, then you will be less likely to cling to it and hold on to it to arise any kind of discontentedness in the mind. So that's what he's explaining to you here so that you can start independently verifying this for yourself and then train the mind so that it's not clinging to this stuff. And wherever you see the mind clinging is you restrain the mind, you pull it back, you cut it off and let it go and pull it back and pull it back and pull it back. Questions on this chapter? It does not appear that we have any questions at this time, sir. All right. So the last chapter for today is chapter 20. The Suitable Way for Attaining Nibbana, Enlightenment, Second Discourse. Monks, I will teach you the way that is suitable for attaining Nibbana, Enlightenment. Listen to that and attend closely, I will speak. And what, monks, is the way that is suitable for attaining Nibbana? Here, a monk sees the eye as discontentedness. He sees forms as discontentedness. He sees eye consciousness as discontentedness. He sees eye contact as discontentedness. He sees discontentedness, whatever feeling arises with eye contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the ear as discontentedness. He sees sounds as discontentedness. He sees ear consciousness as discontentedness. He sees ear contact as discontentedness. He sees as discontentedness, whatever feeling arises with ear contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the nose as discontentedness. He sees odors as discontentedness. He sees nose consciousness as discontentedness. He sees nose contact as discontentedness. He sees as discontentedness, whatever feeling arises with nose contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the tongue as discontentedness. He sees flavors as discontentedness. He sees tongue consciousness as discontentedness. He sees tongue contact as discontentedness. He sees as discontentedness, whatever feeling arises with tongue contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the body as discontentedness. He sees physical objects as discontentedness. He sees body consciousness as discontentedness. He sees body contact as discontentedness. He sees as discontentedness, whatever feeling arises with body contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. He sees the mind as discontentedness. He sees mental objects as discontentedness. He sees mind consciousness as discontentedness. He sees mind contact as discontentedness. He sees as discontentedness, whatever feeling arises with mind contact as condition, whether ple 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 pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. This monk says the way that is suitable for attaining Nibbana, enlightenment. All right, thank you, Miranda. 
So here the Buddha isn't saying literally that the I is discontentedness because when he talks about discontentedness, he talks about pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. That's what are discontent feelings or discontentedness, right? What he's explaining here is that understanding that the I can lead to discontentedness and forms can lead to discontentedness. I consciousness can lead to discontentedness. I contact can lead to discontentedness. He sees as discontentedness whatever feeling arises with eye contact as condition. Because remember that peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy of the enlightened mind, it doesn't arise, it doesn't change, it doesn't fade away. So any feeling that's arising based on eye contact, that's the impermanent condition that you're having these contact through these six sense bases. And then based on that condition, now there's these arising of feelings. That's the discontentedness, the pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. So if you see the likelihood or the danger or the potential of things that you come in contact with through the six sense bases leading to discontentedness, now you're going to be more guarding the doorways to discontentedness. That's what we call the six sense bases as well. We call them the doorways to discontentedness because discontentedness is going to come through these six doorways. Anytime the mind experiences discontentedness, it's going to be something that's coming through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, bodily contact, or the mind itself. That's how the mind experiences discontentedness. So if you understand the potential for discontentedness to arise through these six sense bases, now you'll be more likely to guard those doorways with mindfulness or awareness of mind, being observant, that when you come in contact with something, that there's the potential for discontentedness to arise as a result of these six sense bases. As long as there's central desire in the mind, there's going to be discontentedness there. So that's what he's explaining here. Any questions on this chapter? It does not appear we have any questions at this time, sir. Okay, so this is the last chapter for today, but I would like to just show you that this chapter 21 is essentially the same thing, but he's just talking about non-self here. You can see that he's went through the three universal truths that I share as part of the group learning program. I go through each one of these universal truths and explain what they are. So we'll explore this chapter next week as part of the chapters that we're planning to discuss. But if you're going to read from this point forward, then just know that he's applying the same teaching to non-self that we discussed with impermanence and discontentedness. All right, so next week we're going to be in chapters 21 through chapters 30. So you can explore those prior to class if you like, reading those and or after class. And then when you come to class, you'll be able to participate. And if you have questions that you need clarification on, you might have gathered those as part of your reading. So the way that you get access to these books is you go to buddhadailywisdom.com and then there's a link for free books. You can actually download the books or you can take that file and you can go print it if you like or you can actually order them through Amazon and you can get printed versions of these books already done for you. So that will really help you as you learn and progress on this path and in this program. So next week we'll be exploring chapters 21 through 30. And then tomorrow in the group learning program, there we're focused on volume one of this book series. We're on chapter five, which is titled The Eightfold Path, The Path for All Humans to Enlightenment. And this is a great place for people to start is learning in the group learning program on Sunday. And then if you're able to make Wednesdays, you can do that. But if you can't make these live classes for any reason, there's always recordings in YouTube and Facebook and on our podcast that you can listen to the replay based on your own schedule. But if you attend the live classes, you can ask questions and get clarification during the live classes. So tomorrow in the group learning program at the same time, a nine o'clock p.m. Thai time, whatever time that is in your time zone, I'll be sharing with you chapter five of volume one. And again, you can read that before and or after class. 
On Wednesday, we're going to start our four-part series on Buddhist chanting. I'm going to teach you guys Buddhist chanting from the very beginning, helping you to understand why I do Buddhist chanting and how to do it. We're going to be chanting together as a class, and then I hope you guys with the translations and seeing what the translations of those chants are so that you'll have some more meaning behind the chants themselves. So thank you all for reading. Thank you all for attending class. Thank you for your dedication, your diligence. Thank you to Miranda for moderating. I appreciate all the help and the support to be able to share these teachings with you guys. So thank you all. Have a very lovely rest of your day. We'll see you in a future class. Sawadihap. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment. Enlightenment.